Good Thursday morning, and thanks for joining us from the Ohio Agnet, voice you know with the News You Trust studio, sponsored by Grain Equipment Company, where innovation meets execution. I'm Dusty Sonnenberg. Well, stepping outside this morning, it definitely feels like November. 30 degrees on the barn thermometer on my farm. It looks like we may reach a high of 37 today. Cloudy skies, and it looks like a chance of snow or rain coming up over the next 24 to 36 hours. We still have a long way to go to recharge that soil moisture. This quick calendar reminder Anyone interested in becoming a certified crop advisor should consider attending the Ohio CCA pre-exam preparation class offered by OSU Extension. The sessions will be January 7th and 8th of 2025 and held at the Shelby County Ag Building. Now you can register by calling OSU Extension in Trumbull County. They're number 330-638-6783 or check out the corn newsletter for more details. Well, let's check in now on our weekly update from the Ohio Soybean Council. Today we're visiting with Jim Douglas. He's a Shelby County, Indiana farmer, happens to serve on the U.S. Soybean Board, USB, and also through that serves on the U.S. Meat Export Federation Board. Jim tells us about the successes seen in U.S. soy through the work of the U.S. Meat Export Federation. The, you know, for an example, 2010-2011, the U.S. exported 9 million metric short tons. Come up to the present day, they're estimated we're going to export 17 and a half million uh, metric short tons. So that's almost twofold increase in the product leaving the U.S. Now, I think the most opportunity for increasing U.S. soy remains in the meats. Currently, 24% of our beans are exported through pork alone. Rising incomes are a major driver in increased meat consumption. Look at the potential we have as, US, as USMEF is working on in 80 countries promoting U.S. product, pork, beef, and lamb. And, and just pay attention when you go buy different products and countries pop up that you maybe have never heard of and so forth or you didn't buy from last year, no matter what type of item it is, and they have our currency and they're wanting to improve uh, their diets. Most of, the, most of these countries have a small livestock industry and their diets are not up to standard quality standards that's going to maximize efficiency. So that, But really to increase their meat supply, most of them, they don't have the grains. They're going to look for imports. And so that's where the USMEF is in those countries working to show that uh, quality products we have. Again, our guest, Jim Douglas, part of the United Soybean Board, talking about the work of the U.S. Meat Export Federation on behalf of Ohio soybean farmers. Today's update was brought to you by the Ohio Soybean Council and your soybean checkoff. Let's take a look now at that Thursday morning weather forecast brought to us by Seed Consultants. Simply better performance online at seedconsultants.com. Cold air and wintry mix conditions dominating the Ohio landscape today. I'm Chief Meteorologist Ryan Martin with a look at that Ohio Ag weather update. Here's what's going on. We've got a strong upper level low sitting over the northern Great Lakes. Around it circulates a big batch of moisture, cloud cover, cold air. It's all getting drugged down into the eastern Corn Belt. This low is going to be moving painfully slow to the east and northeast finally exiting out of our area sometime on Saturday. So for the next couple of days, we're going to feel like winter pretty easily here, looking at on-again, off-again moisture. Could be a cold rain or sloppy wet snowflakes. The best snow potential happens in the overnight periods and close to the Lake Erie shoreline, but... I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to rule out sloppy wet snowflakes anywhere at this point. I think liquid equivalents are going to be a few hundreds to a few tenths, that is all. But again, kind of a sloppy setup here. Any sunshine you see over the next few days, call it a bonus. I don't rule out sunshine. A lot of times in lake effect circulations, you end up with patches of clouds and then sunshine right after. But I also don't want to wave the all-clear flag yet. I think we have two rounds of moisture that are going to try and come through, one today and one later tomorrow into early Saturday. We see temperatures moderating on Sunday and into early next week. I'm also trending the forecast next week a little drier now. We may end up being able to miss some precipitation here and end up not seeing decent moisture until late next week, Saturday into Sunday, right about the time we flip the calendar from November into December. I'm looking for a little bit more data to come in on the Tuesday system before I say I think we miss it in, in entirety, but right now I'm definitely trending drier. 
That's the way your forecast is stacking up. I'm meteorologist Ryan Martin. Thanks, Ryan. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more after this. Since 1926, Nationwide has been rooted in agriculture. Founded as the Farm Bureau Mutual Automobile Insurance Company with a mission to protect farmers and their communities, we honor our legacy by offering solutions that evolve with the complex needs of today's farms. As the leading insurer of America's farms and trusted by eight farm bureaus for 100 years and counting, Nationwide is on your side. Number one insurer based on 2023 direct written premium per AM best. Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company and Affiliates, Columbus, Ohio. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. Let's catch up now with Dale Mino as he has an industry update from the National Farm Broadcasters Association annual convention. Joining me is Ryan Van Rokel. We're talking to the Pivot Bio today. And Ryan, for those that may not remember, we actually have some original research, I believe, done in Ohio on this product. Where does Pivot Bio fit in today's production for farmers? Yeah, thanks for taking the time to meet with me. Uh, Pivot Bio is still pretty new to a lot of folks. And uh, so as a reminder to those that haven't heard, we we are a microbial nitrogen source. And so a lot of folks know soybeans fix their own nitrogen. People have been trying for years to do that on corn. And uh, we did that too, kind of failed. But turns out if you focus on the bacteria that do the actual fixing, that's where the magic's at. And so we've got some proprietary gene edits that really unlock that potential. And we've got farmers all across the nation that are replacing a portion of their nitrogen fertilizer using Pivot Bio instead and getting the same or better yields at the end of the year. So remind everyone, is this a replacement product or an additional product to their current farming practice and when does it get introduced to the system yeah so the replacement or addition is uh, somewhat up to the farmer uh, a lot of folks you know for a lot of years think always thought that more 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 always more nitrogen more yield we're learning a lot more that that's not always the case and so in general we would recommend a replacement where you replace a portion of that nitrogen fertilizer that's subject to washing away whenever you get too much rain and use pivot bio instead ryan thanks for the update hey thanks for having me taking a look at your agricultural headlines president joe biden is asking congress to fund 21 billion dollars in aid for farmers and ranchers as part of a 98.6 billion dollar overall disaster package the president proposed that congress pass before the end of the year now in a letter to house speaker mike johnson the white House detailed some of the country's needs recovering from natural disasters and economic challenges. The president cited a need to provide more emergency funding to help communities recover from Hurricane Helene and Milton, as well as other natural disasters. Now, to bolster the president's request, the White House Office of Management and Budget released a disaster assessment from the different federal departments. Included was a letter from Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack to congressional appropriators earlier in November. The letter said due to the level of devastation resulting from Hurricanes Helene and Milton, the department will likely need additional tools to comprehensively address the challenges of producers and rural communities. For instance, without additional funding for emergency watershed protection, assistance to local communities to clear debris and restore culverts, bridges, and other infrastructure will be delayed. In recent disasters, Congress provided additional funding to support farmers and ranchers with crop losses. Without this funding, uninsured producers will not get any assistance. Now, for the USDA, Biden proposed $23.5 billion overall, the lion's share of which would go to help farmers and ranchers who have suffered livestock or crop losses due to the hurricanes, droughts, and wildfires. And another $1 billion will go to the Emergency Watershed Protection Program, that to help rural communities deal with debris removal and infrastructure repairs. The USDA funding would also go to create permanent pay reforms for federal wildfire firefighters and support food aid to people hit by disasters and food banks that may have been affected by Hurricanes Helene and Milton. Biden's letter also cited the Small Business Administration has already had its disaster loan program completely exhausted, and Congress must act to restore that $2 billion in funding. The White House stated that the SBA loans are pivotal 
lifelines for local businesses. The SBA had received more than 100,000 loan applications just tied to Hurricanes Helene and Milton. The White House also added the American people cannot afford to any further delay the restoration of this vital funding. The White House also proposed $40 billion to restore funding for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, which has been trying to support recovery from the two hurricanes. Congress last passed a comprehensive disaster package in 2022 and as recently as 2017 spent over $120 billion in disaster aid following Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Now, House Ag Committee Chairman Glenn Thompson on Monday also highlighted his tour through Florida and Georgia to see the hurricane damage, and Thompson cited projections from the University of Georgia that the hurricane caused an overall economic impact of $6.46 billion to the ag industry in that state. In Florida, state officials estimated Milton caused between $1.5 billion and $2.5 billion in damage to crops and agricultural infrastructure. Stay tuned. We'll be back to take a look at your markets after this. In a time of tight margins when every penny counts, could you be saving more on your monthly energy bill? Ohio Farm Bureau is here to help members get competitive electric and natural gas supply prices through its energy savings program. Participants save an average of 10% on their rates. Let Ohio Farm Bureau help you take the guesswork out of energy savings. Request your free bill analysis at ofb.ag backslash energy program. Savings not guaranteed. Actual savings may vary. It's time now for your morning Louis Dreyfus grain analysis brought to you by the Ohio Soybean Council and your soybean checkoff. Let's check in with Ryan Martin. Grain markets finish mixed on Wednesday. Corn finished one to three higher. Wheat up anywhere from two to five. But soybeans were down a six to nine cents on the uh, contracts. Bean oil down triple digits. Bean meal did get slightly positive as we went through the day on Wednesday. Reasons for the market move. Well, interestingly enough, we were red everywhere to start the day yesterday. And then Ukraine fired some missiles into Russia. The market decided, hey, we should probably pay attention here just a little bit. Overall, the UK Storm Shadow missile was sent into Russia yesterday. No word on damage. Ukraine continues to look to bombard the interior of Russia. Moscow has yet to respond, but an escalation of the war is feared. And that's what really got wheat and corn on the page yesterday. Uh, we are hearing that Ukraine is targeting Russian military facilities and is not targeting crude oil or grain export infrastructure yet. Russia continues to grain or export grain normally, at least as of right now. Uh, soybeans did hold key support yesterday at 996. That was in the March contract. We finished at 9.99 and a quarter. So the fact that that support held is giving us a little bit of hope. There's a chance that soybean futures can bounce. But I have to tell you, seasonal price trends are turning bearish following the Thanksgiving holiday. If there is not a South American weather problem, as the weather looks right now, I don't expect a South American weather problem to come into the equation. Part of the reason is La Nina. May turn into a no nina. That's a headline I saw yesterday. It looks like the cooling of the Pacific waters in the equatorial region has slowed such that we're not projecting any long-term weather issues in Brazil and Argentina. A lot of times drought can manifest in a strong La Nina if it's weak to nothing. I think we're looking at normal weather patterns down in that part of the world. That's a look at your market recap. I'm Ryan Martin. Thanks, Ryan. Let's take a look now at your markets brought to us by Seed Consultants. Simply better performance online at seedconsultants.com. December corn closed up three cents and March corn was up two and a quarter. January soybeans closed down eight cents and March soybeans were down nine and a quarter. March Kansas City wheat closed up three and one quarter cent while March Chicago wheat was up four and a half and March Minneapolis wheat closed up one penny. Taking a look now at the overnight trade, December corn is trading down a quarter penny at $4.30. March corn is unchanged at four dollars forty cents january soybeans are trading up two and a quarter cent at nine dollars ninety two and three quarter cent with march beans up two cents at ten dollars one and one quarter cent and wheat for december is trading up a penny and three quarters at five dollars fifty four and one quarter cent march wheat up a penny and three quarters at five dollars seventy four cents in the livestock side december live cattle closed the day down 27 and a half cents at 186.30 with february cattle down seven and a half cents 187 dollars 92 and a half cents december lean hogs closed 
closed up 97 and a half cents at $80.52 and a half cents, and February hogs were up $1.60 at 84 47 and a half. Feeder cattle for January closed the day up 32 and a half cents at 252.32 and a half, and Class 3 milk for December was down 22 cents, $18.93. You're listening to the Ohio Agnet.